Well, um, thank, thank you for coming, first of all, and um, I hope that you've had a chance to see it a, at least a little bit, and if not, you know, I'll keep this brief um, enough so that you can watch it afterward. Um, it's really strange with this microphone. Uh, it's like I'm talking to myself. Um, so, like, as Shannon was saying, this, the title of this piece is The Water and the Blood, and it's, uh, it loops continuously. It's 27 minutes long, um, and there are three discrete audio tracks uh, that are synchronized with the work, um, one being the musical score that you hear uh, in the space, and the other two being um, accessed via headphones over there. And, you know, it's, all of it's obviously optional except for the, the score. You kind of have to listen to that. Um, but you know that that uh, makes it a piece that you, if you really want to experience like all the sort of ways of, of engaging with it, you have to do it at least three times. So um, you know you have to dedicate an hour and a half to it, which is asking a lot in a lot of ways. But hopefully, it's engaging enough that you won't mind that. Um, so I'll just start kind of briefly telling you about uh, the process and then we'll talk a little bit about concept maybe and then maybe just, just a little bit about content. Um, we shot this film over about six weeks of shooting, active shooting. We spent a lot of time before that doing pre-production and finding locations and um, casting actors, um, obviously kind of developing the the script and the story and those sorts of things and um, you know actually kind of developing uh, methods of shooting that we were going to use on the project and uh, as a part of the working artist project I had uh, the option of having an assistant that was uh, paid for by Mocha GA or paid for by the grant and uh, I sort of split it into two assistants and so I had two assistants for less time than I would have had one but uh, it worked out really well so one of, one of my assistants is here Chris Escobar and I don't think Steven's here, I think he's working, but um, I worked with my assistants and we kind of developed what we were going to do and we worked on kind of ways of shooting that we were going to use on the, on the project and kind of did some things that I've never done before. And, uh, it, was, it, was a lot of, it was a lot of fun, it was a lot of hard work, but uh, I think the results um, you know, were uh, worth it uh, in, the, in, in the end. But we shot in Georgia. Ex almost all, well, all of it was shot in Georgia. Um, most of it was shot, you know, a short drive from Atlanta, maybe 45 minutes outside of Atlanta. Most of the farms were located south of the city, near Palmetto, outside of Palmetto. Um, the lake scenes were shot in Milledgeville at uh, Lake Sinclair, and um, the uh, cattle auction scenes were shot in Carrollton, Georgia and the uh, wrestling match was shot in Franklin, Georgia, which is sort of near LaGrange. It's kind of southwest. Um, it's a small little town, but um, all of it was in Georgia, which in a way was kind of important to keep it in Georgia and, and film with, um, with those locations in mind and uh, because that's where the story is, is essentially set. Um, so uh, it's obviously you can see just talk a little. I'll talk a little bit about the kind of format of its eight. It's made up of eight images that are all synchronized. At times it maybe seems like they're not, but um, they are all playing back in, in synchronicity, and uh, you know which is in turn synchronized with the audio. But uh, each image is um, a high definition video, and so we have essentially eight high definition videos that are playing back at once. Um, and, and part of that is if you're familiar with kind of my work in the past, uh, I, I like to situate the viewer inside of the space uh, in such a way as to make them an active participant. So um, in almost everything, either due to positioning of image or scale of image, it's impossible to sort of see everything at once. So you have to select what you're looking at and uh, um, by default, you become an editor in the work, so you, uh, you know, I'm kind of presenting you with as many different sort of views or angles or different stories as possible, and you're choosing what to look at and um, kind of what stories you're going to piece together uh, from what you've seen. And uh, that too makes it a different experience every time you watch it because chances are you'll see something different that you didn't see the last time and chances are the person next to you saw something different than, than you saw. 
So um, really it makes it hopefully something that you can engage with uh, you know, as, as many times as you want um, for all intents and purposes. Uh, um, you also become a participant in the audio choice. So you, you make the choice as to what you want to hear and you don't have to listen to those things or you, you can or you, or you can listen to one or you can listen to all three. Um, but it's all about kind of engaging um, the, the viewer as a participant and creating a very open text where you bring your own context to the narrative that's being played out. And to that end, I you know, intentionally will keep the narrative pretty sparse, so it's, it's open. I mean, if you listen to some of the audio tracks, you get clues as to what's going on, but it's not a traditional narrative um, where plot is like really straightforward, plot is really kind of uh, in the foreground. This is much more, um, even, even in relationship to what the characters are saying, it's, it's, it's more about a characterization, uh, so what they say directs you less towards sort of the plot of the story or the narrative of the story and more toward the um, kind of development of their character. Um, so that's the process. Um, and, and we started getting into the concept a little bit. Um, uh, I'm, try I'm debating as to what, like how much to really say about the content of the work because I don't want to kind of I don't want to kind of impose my intentions on your experience of it, so, or impose like, you know, what, what I started with, you know, I start with the sort of seed of a story and then develop it from there, but I don't really want to impose that upon, upon your viewing of it, but of course I will entertain questions at any point um, ab about content and, and try and answer them in a way that I feel is uh, accurate and honest while still allowing you your interpretation of it. But, you know, for me, it's important that it be very open, and it's important that it be um, uh, that that it that it's okay for people to have different interpretations of it and different experiences of it. And if I, if I like sort of solidify a story, then I, you know I don't want to like devalue anybody's anybody else's sort of uh, experience of it or um, or interpretation of it. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the audio now. Uh, one audio track, you'll hear um, these characters delivering monologues, and there's one little bit of dialogue between the two children. And then you'll also hear kind of diegetic sound, sound that's sort of emanating from the scenes. Uh, a lot of it was natural sound we recorded and then sort of remixed into the, because there are eight channels, we had to sort of select what natural sound you're hearing. So at times you'll hear sound from the wrestling match or sound from the cow field, but uh, you know, we, we couldn't like obviously present all the sound from all eight channels, it would just become cacophony. So we sort of select what you hear and then, you know, in a way that kind of is directing how, how you see the piece. Um, but you'll hear the characters and they are kind of addressing, directly addressing the camera or the viewer and, and delivering these monologue speeches which, uh, you know, in a way are patterned after interviews or documentary style interviews where they're kind of giving you their, a lot of times they're talking about very specific things, but those specific things are illuminating their worldview, you know, their, their, the character, not like moral character, but the characterization of, of each, um, each person in the film. Um, and then the other, the other soundtrack, well, well, that soundtrack kind of gives you clues too as to the narrative, as to what's going on, like the, gives you kind of plot points. Um, and then the other soundtrack is sort of, I would say, uh, well, let me tell you about it first. It's, it's a construction of sort of, I would call them found texts, texts pulled from other writings. Um, and that's mixed in with uh, original writings. And that was done by John Harkey, who is here. Uh, I should probably address him as Dr. John Harkey. Uh, it sounds weird though, um, but uh, he, he, he wrote these things and then arranged these found texts in response to the images. And then we took his text and recorded a voiceover, had an, act, had an actor record a voiceover, and then sort of um, ar arranged it with the, uh, with the imagery. So, um, that, and, and that text, I would, I would describe it more um, as, as more of a sort of philosophical musing on what's happening, whereas the 
Um, whereas the characters are kind of giving you these very specific direct things that maybe illuminate some philosophical ideas, this is kind of the reverse of that. So, um, you know, I, I hope that you'll get a chance to listen to both because I think they kind of interact with the piece in very different ways. Um, and then the score, the score was done, uh, I, I worked with, usually I, I record and um, mix and everything, the music myself, but this time I was fortunate to work with Ryan Huff, who was here earlier but had to leave. Um, and uh, so I performed part of the a part of what you're hearing and then he performed some of it and then we kind of mixed it together and then he mastered it all um, which was you know a real a, a huge advantage to have somebody very talented to do that sort of work um, so I think I think I'll just open it up for questions I think I've kind of covered um, I think I've covered the bases. Um, we, well, let me talk quickly. One of our actors is here, Wes Atkinson, Wesley Atkinson, and we did a casting call for, for the majority of these characters. Uh, a couple of them, however, are relatives, and if you've seen other of my work, it typically involves at least one relative. So um, the little blonde-headed boy is my nephew, and then um, the girl that works at the laundromat is my sister-in-law, so my wife's sister. Uh, and then the rest were actors that we held a casting call for and were amazingly fortunate to get some really incredible actors. And not just the ones that we cast, but we had some really great actors respond to this casting call. So it's, I think Atlanta's really, I think, I don't know, I'll have to ask Wes about it, but maybe I think that like the, some of the, um, I think that the movie industry in Atlanta has like helped in, in sort of encouraging people to be actors who are really talented at being actors. And so we got some really great response um, and we're really fortunate to have a great selection to choose from and we're able to choose like really excellent people to be in this film, so, um, and you know, what's more amazing is, um, you know, how talented and dedicated they are to something that's so different than a normal film. You know, it's uh, told everybody in the casting call that you would have to be kind of patient in the process because it's eight channels, so we have to do things like, we have to do things really like eight times more than you do when you film a, a, a normal film. And also, um, Part of the way I work is, is very improvisational, so it kind of, I think it sort of stretches people, you know, there's not a script that says like everything that's gonna happen. I mean, obviously the, the monologues are scripted to a degree and, and we kind of know where we're going and what scenes go when and where, and so we understand kind of the arc of the story, but most of the scene, you know, it's, it's just it's an improvisation between the actors, so it's a, it's a difficult thing, but in the end, I think if they can do it, which these actors were able to do it really well, it feels very natural and it feels very real. So, um, and then, of course, the wrestlers who were in um, Franklin, Georgia, were incredibly um, willing to participate in this. And that was an event that, uh, that they, they did regularly, and so um, we just were able to kind of get permission to come in and uh, film there, and they were very accommodating. They even... Um, kind of tweaked to their normal costuming and normal kind of schedule to fit the the look of the film a little bit. So it was it was uh, great. And and that's sort of pardon? Well, a lot of modern wrestling, uh, we ran into this um, when we were trying to find somewhere to do it. A lot of it's like really people have like really um, I don't know, like, they have, like, kind of goth costuming, a lot of makeup, I think, you know, people wear a lot of makeup and, like, spikes and stuff on their costumes, and so we didn't, obviously, we didn't want any of that. We wanted it to have, you know, an, like, an old school feel, and so they, um, they were able to kind of, kind of create a lineup of wrestlers that would fit into that better, so it, uh, that, that was kind of the main way that they did it. And then, you know, some of them even changed, like, what they, you know, kind of their normal, their normal um, persona for the project. So, um, okay, I think I've said uh, everything that I, you know, care to say in a way. So, if anybody, if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them now. 
and we can do a few questions like this and then I'll, um, I'll be standing out there so people can watch in here and we'll turn the music back up and I'll answer questions out there as well. But, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, right, okay, that's a good, that's a really, that's a good question. So, um, we're presenting this as sort of a multifaceted view, you know, so it's, you're seeing different angles of the same action a lot. Um, but for the overwhelming majority of what we, what we shot, we just shot with one camera. So it is being reenacted, you know, so uh, there are subtle differences. And because it's mostly improvisational, you can pick up on these differences in the way people perform each scene. Um, but it's, but it's still kind of as reading as these different angles. Uh, there, there are a couple exceptions. We did at, at the camp out, there were maybe, I don't know how many actually made it in that were like being presented simultaneously. I know of, I can say concretely that there are like two shots that were shot with um, two different cameras at the same time. Um, but they're really pretty short shots. So mo almost, I would say, you know, almost all of it was shot with one camera, multiple, kind of multiple takes. No, it's choreographed, it's synchronized. So it's gonna be the same every time you watch it. Um, all the playback is um, synchronized. So, which is sort of a technical feat or technical, a big technical obstacle, but um, I've, fortunately I kind of like figured it out over time. The first few iterations of things I did were very difficult to synchronize, but now there's like better technology I've discovered that makes it a little easier. And um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's still difficult, but it's really doable now. So the jet is synchronized, even though there are mom moments where screens go black, but those are all kind of, um, kind of intentional spaces, basically.